pray as uh, we stand together. Lord, would you open this scripture to us? Would you speak to our hearts? And may my words be in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you for your welcome. Um, and I'm glad that John clarified that it was harvest, because I was thinking, you know, Christmas or Halloween. I wasn't quite sure. Uh, <laughs> But um, it's really good to be here. I haven't, uh, haven't preached for a while here, um, although I was here last week for, for Moyna's licensing, which was great. And uh, for those of you who weren't here that evening, David Lee, uh, our archdeacon, was preaching. And I thought, really, his talk was, was excellent. It was kind of a no-frills uh, talk, but it was full of scripture, uh, full, of, full of powerful truth, I thought. And really, he was speaking. He was speaking about the authority we have as the people of God uh, not just those who are ordained who've, or got a special role, but the whole people of God uh, to minister as Jesus ministered. And his focus uh, last week was particularly on, on deliverance ministry, casting out unclean spirits. Um, we'll deal with that in a minute. But <laughs> I'll say, I'm reliably informed it's modelled on Angus McNabb. Um, <laughs> am I not? Right, okay, well... I think Angus's family may need some, uh, <laughs> some premise. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, that's, um. so David was talking about, about deliverance ministry, but, but we, I think we could equally extend his principle to the things in the Gospels Jesus did and then taught his disciples, taught us to do, go and do likewise. So, uh, praying for people, uh, proclaiming the good news, healing the sick. The focus of the, of the passage we've just heard from Luke is on healing, isn't it? Uh, and I want to just tease out three things this evening that I think this passage has to say to us. So I want to focus on, on faith, on identity, and on gratitude. And uh, there may be some overlap with what I have to say about gratitude and, and, and what we've been thinking about this morning. But, but firstly, faith. Um, now, faith is what Christianity is all about, isn't it, really? Trust, trust in God, trust that what the Scripture says about God, that he's the creator of all, that in the person of Jesus Christ, he has become flesh, uh, and that he forgives and accepts those who believe Jesus is that Messiah uh, who died for us and was raised for us, and is coming again, actually, at the end of time. Faith that these things are actually true. So that's kind of big picture faith, if you like. The content of our belief that defines what we're all about. This faith is a kind of radical trust in God that surrenders ourselves to him out of humble obedience. And recognizing as well that whatever our particular gifts, whatever our particular good works, uh, ultimately we all are relying on God's mercy, God's grace. So big picture faith. Uh, and this is the kind of faith that, that saves. And so when the Samaritan uh, leper returns to Jesus, glorifying God, Jesus recognizes in him not just uh, a healthy body, but an obedient spirit, a trusting heart. He'd believed and been set free. His faith had saved him. But the Bible also mentions faith occasionally as a spiritual gift. Um, in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where, where Paul's talking about different spiritual gifts, the gift of faith is list, listed directly before the gift of healing. And this, this gift of faith might be a confidence in God for a, for a given situation. Anything, really, I guess. A new job, somebody's conversion, the regeneration of an area, perhaps. A particular trust in God. And I think this is significant because... Because I think Jesus had this gift of faith. I think he saw the world through eyes that trusted God in each and every situation. So he trusted, even as he wrestled with God in prayer at Gethsemane, that, that the Father could somehow work his death for good. And in the events of his ministry, because of this close relationship with God, uh, he was able to trust that God would do great things as he stepped out in faith. 
And I don't think this, this is unique to Jesus uh, in virtue of, of him being God's son. So in the Old Testament reading, Elisha too seems to have a real concrete assurance that God can heal Naaman for his greater glory, that he might know that there is a prophet in the land, uh, Elisha says. And there's other examples in the Bible we could detail of, of that kind of real faith in God. And you might think, well, if this is a special gift, uh, that's great. God's given it to some people, but he hasn't given it to me. And, and to some extent, God, of course, in his wisdom, distributes his gifts uh, as he sees fit. So to one person this, to another person that. But having said that, I don't think it's any coincidence, really, that for Jesus and Elisha, this gift of faith seems to be something that's strong with them. And what I'd suggest unites them is that same closeness to God, that commitment to prayer. You know, people sometimes say, the more we pray, the more coincidences we see happen. And I think the same kind of principle applies here. So the more time we spend with God, the more our faith in his power, in his ability to change lives, to transform situations increases. Um, I have a, a good friend who uh, is a curate in Leeds. He was ordained the same time as me. And a, a good part of his work really is spent in the, in the city centre with people with, um, well, homeless people and people with drug and alcohol addictions. And, and recently he's seen some really remarkable healings. Um, not the sort of thing you can just say, well, that was psychosomatic or something. People regaining their sight, things like that. You know, and, and not everybody, not every single person uh, my friend John prays with gets healed. But some people do. And he, he, he makes that decision to pray, to pray with people, to trust that God could heal them. And, and he should at least pray for that. And I think the more we, we step out in this kind of trust, the more we'll see God do those kinds of things, if you like. And that, in turn, reinforces our faith. It's a kind of a virtuous circle. Looking back in, uh, in Christian history, back in the 19th century, there was an uh, evangelist called George Muller. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He, he was German, but he spent most of his life in Bristol. And he was, he was very much involved with, with sort of creating orphanages and, and places to care for the destitute. And he said that the same thing, really. If, if we're desiring our faith to be strengthened, we shouldn't shrink back from those opportunities where our faith might be tried, but through trial strengthened. And he was someone who really put that, that principle to the test. Um, and so it's a risk, isn't it? It's a risk when we do that, but I think... We've got, it all, we've got to always realise that we're held in the love of God when we step out in, in faith. And so George uh, Muller famously never, never asked any donations of people. He relied on those gifts coming in through God's providence, really, uh, trusting to meet not just his needs, but all these orphans he was looking after. And on one famous occasion at the orphanage, uh, they sat down in the morning, they gave thanks for their breakfast. There was nothing actually in the house. And as they finished their prayer, um, unexpectedly, the baker knocked on the door, had lots of fresh bread. The milkman's cart broke down outside their orphanage, milk as well. You know, and, and, and people could say, well, that's a coincidence, isn't it? But, you know, I'm not sure. So faith, trust in God. And secondly, identity. Identity is a, is a significant factor in both those passages we heard from the Old and the New Testaments. Because there's the identity of Naaman, uh, not originally part of the people of Israel, a foreigner, albeit a powerful and influential man, a Syrian general. And then there's, compared to the identity of this uh, quite insignificant, really, uh, Jewish serving girl living in exile in a strange land. And then there's the ten lepers themselves, with everything that entailed for their identity. Because, you know, if you read the New Testament... Leprosy was something that really marked people out as unclean, set them apart uh, from their communities, from their families, from, from the temple, from the very presence of God himself. And also, uh, to be a Samaritan as well was a kind of double whammy of, of uncleanness, if you like. So for Orthodox Jews, these people were not ones you'd want to be spending much time with. 
but it's the leper who's the Samaritan who comes back and gives thanks. So there's different identities at play here. But I think the key, the key identity, the key aspect for us in this gospel story is the fact that this man, this, this Samaritan leper, recognized that his particular identity had been completely transformed through his encounter with Jesus. He was healed, and his identity was no longer that of, of someone whom people shunned and avoided. His identity was no longer a, a kind of byword for contamination, for disease, for impurity. His identity was that of a, of a restored new creation, God had totally reshaped his identity forever. What does that have to say to us? Well, I, well, I think if you come here tonight, this evening, and you're perhaps struggling with some aspect of your identity, and sometimes they're, they're big things, uh, sometimes they're things other people know about, sometimes they're things that are known only to God. But identity is such a key thing. And, and so it may be you're here tonight, you feel like certain things just circumscribe your life and almost define you as a human being. Now, that could be a whole range of things, and, and I don't want to go into that. But if there are things for you that, that when I said that, that, that rings a bell, or the first thing that kind of popped into your mind then, I want to say that, that that issue, that thing, whatever it is, that does not define you as a person. In fact, it's not even the most important thing in your life. It's not the most important thing to your identity. So if you forget everything else, I say, please hold on to this. And if you're thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me, or you know, I've done things that are so bad, or my sin is too severe, or... I just, I feel God can't love me anymore, then, then really you're exactly who I'm speaking to tonight. And the most important thing is that you are loved by God, that that is what your identity is, someone who is loved by God, someone who's precious to him, someone who's redeemed, who's been bought by the very blood of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit. The most important thing about your identity is that you're a child of God. Beloved, righteous, pure in Christ. You know, whatever that leper's identity had been, and whatever issues he still had to process through, this guy had grasped the one thing needful, that he was loved by God, that God had healed him, and that God would be with him forever. So how could he not be grateful? This brings us to, to our final point, really, that flowing out of identity and, and rooted in our faith comes gratitude. Um, we've just had our gift day at St. Michael's a couple of weeks ago, uh, and obviously you've been thinking about harvest and, and Thanksgiving today. And in the weeks leading up to our gift day, we, we've been thinking a lot about our giving and about how about how our, uh, or rather God's generosity provides kind of the pattern for all our giving, all our acts of kindness and love. And thinking about how we put thankfulness and gratitude right at the heart of the Christian life, right at the heart of our discipleship. And this, this episode in Luke is very much a story about gratitude, about how only one of those ten lepers healed returned to glorify God and thank Jesus for his healing. And Jesus, you know, it's interesting that Jesus notices that. It's not like he just is unconcerned that the other nine basically go on their merry way. Gratitude matters to God. Our, our attitude matters to God. And it's much easier, I think, in, in the West to take things for granted sometimes. Um, so if, for example, you were to, to distribute... Uh, 30 pencils to a, to a class of school children in Britain. You'd hope they'd say thank you, but they probably wouldn't be jumping for joy. It probably wouldn't be the most significant thing that happened to them that day, in fact. Now, if you took that same box of pencils and you 
distribute into a class of uh, school kids in, say, rural Africa, the effect would be much different. Um, and I know this because when I was teaching in Malawi, I almost caused a riot, uh, not even with pencils, but just giving out a stack of A4 paper. Um, we were going to do some drawing, and we needed some paper. An absolute pandemonium broke out, so desperate were these boys just to get their hands on a sheet of plain paper. I dread to think what would have happened if, uh, you know, pencils, pens would have been involved. The, the point of that is I don't, I don't think... British kids are fundamentally more ungrateful than Malawian kids. I don't think that's true. I think it's an issue about fami familiarity, really. And that, you know, for us to get a pencil is, is no big deal, really, is it? You know, you get pens and pencils through the post in surveys that you get sent. But I think it's something about familiarity, dulling our appreciation, dulling a sense of wonder and, and also gratitude. And I think the same can sometimes be true for us in our Christian lives about our relationship with God. Is it a big deal for us that, that God has made us his friends? That the, the king of the universe has, has, has provided salvation for us, has provided a way uh, of life and knowing him and a quality of relationship with him now and something even greater to come. And I know a lot of the time I'm, I'm, I'm not really. I sort of sail, I sail through my life and occasionally I think, oh, you know, it's, it's good that God loves us and stuff. But, but what I tend to focus on a lot of the time are the things I don't have rather than the things I do have. The things I don't have rather than the things I already enjoy. That may just be me, but I suspect it might be a, a, common, a common thing. How often do we do that? And a lot of the time, my, my love for God is just really not what it, what it should or could be. And so Jesus encourages us in this, in this encounter with these lepers to take stock, to remember all that we've received, all we have to be thankful for, and, and not just all we have to be thankful for, but, but to whom we have to direct that thanks and praise. And gratitude to God is, is best cultivated in an atmosphere of, of humility, I think. The two kind of go hand in hand. So Naaman's problem initially is, is he originally thinks himself above uh, these instructions. You know, oh, this, why should I go wash in your, you know, Israeli river? I want to go to, back, to, back to Syria. And it's only, after, it's only after he humbles himself. And again, it's, someone, it's one of his servants that has to convince him of this. It's only after he humbles himself that he's healed and in his healing discovers true thankfulness and worship. Naaman's identity, like that of the leper who was healed, would forever be marked by faith and gratitude. Faith and gratitude. Not bad things, I think, for us to aspire to. Should we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the, the gift of your scripture and we thank you for these two stories of encounter and healing, transformation, new possibility. We thank you for what they say to us, whatever issues we are struggling with in our identity, whatever things might define or circumscribe us. We thank you that they do not have to because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because of who we are in Jesus. And I, I pray today that you would really increase in us a spirit of trust, that gift of faith the Bible speaks of. That you would root our identities not in what the world says we are, not in even what we might tell ourselves we are sometimes, but in your love for us what your word says to us. So may we abound in gratitude to you for all you've done as we grow in the knowledge and love of you. And we ask these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.